Um, forensic led policing or leading investigations through forensic evidence has had a significant impact um, on the solving of crime, certainly as our techniques improve and the quality of the evidence that we're able to obtain. Um, one of the things that it has done, certainly with DNA, if I use that as an example, uh, with sexual offences, uh, it provides very compelling evidence and from that perspective provides somewhat a deterrent uh, for offenders. Um, we have national, established national databases for both fingerprints and DNA and certainly they will expand into other biometrics. Um, this assists us with uh, apprehending offenders that repeat offend uh, and certainly if our efficiencies uh, remain at the, the rate they are, we're able to stop offenders from re-offending re uh, before we're able to uh, apprehend them. There's also a volume of blood which suggests that a person has laid here bleeding for some time. Because the victim was actually located in this area, that's consistent with uh, the version of events that we've received thus far. There's also a lot of contact staining on the wall, which is uh, caused by blood uh, being placed onto another surface and spread around in that location. There's a number of areas that are consistent with that, which could have come from either the offender or from the victim. There's also another pattern over here, which is consistent with what we call an arterial spurt, which is what happens when a, an artery or a vessel within the body is breached by an implement and blood, as it's being pumped through the body by the heart, spurts out through this breach and results in a specific type of pattern. There's also another pattern on the wall, which you can see, which goes across from one wall onto another. This pattern's identified as a cast-off pattern, and that's as a result of blood being flung from a bloodied object um, under force. So usually implements such as a bat, a knife, or um, any type of implement that has blood on it, even a hand can cause this kind of pattern. What we can tell from uh, this type of pattern is the number of blows, generally speaking, and sometimes we can even tell things of the offender, uh, for example, what hand they are, what handedness they are, whether they're left or right handed, depending on the orientation of certain bits of evidence. So from this crime scene we can see that there's one cast off pattern and as a general rule of thumb when there's one cast off pattern it often means that there's two blows depending on the type of implement that's been used to cause the bloodletting event. Um, usually you need one blow to cause the uh, blood source to become apparent and then the second blow will cause the, um, the pattern to uh, be flung from the object. So in this case, a general rule of thumb is that there's been at least two, uh, two stabs uh, or two hits with some sort of weapon. The next piece of evidence located over here, which we now believe to be foreign to the actual crime scene, was a T-shirt uh, that may or may not have been left by the offender. It's also been packaged and taken away uh, for further analysis at our laboratory in the hope that we can identify its actual owner. That's going to be uh, an area of importance to us because um, we get quite good DNA results from around the collar. So we would, um, we, I would get the scientific officer to subsample that. How does the DNA tape lift actually work? Within the package is a, an adhesive tape lift which has a backing on it. So you would peel the adhesive tape from the backing and you would uh, touch onto the area where you were targeting on the porous surface and then that piece of tape then goes into the tube which is used in the robotic system out at Queensland Health for their DNA profiling. Is the DNA tape lift a new technology? Yes, no, that, that is the first time that it has been used in Australia. We're the only ones who are using that technique, yes. The part played by forensics to this date has not been quantified as yet. The service is looking at uh, possible ways to record instances when forensic evidence has actually played a critical part in the laying of charges as opposed to simply supporting those charges. Intuitively, uh, forensic uh, sciences plays a particularly important role in the solving of crime or the investigation process. Uh, the Queensland Police Forensic Services uh, supplies the names of approximately 14,000 people to investigators every year, um, which adds to the uh, solving of crime at the very early stages in the investigation. Um, as far as the justice's outcomes are concerned, uh, a project sponsored by the National Institute of Forensic Science involving a PhD student is currently underway in Tasmania 
to progress our understanding of the contribution that forensic science plays to the conviction rates. Can you tell us about this piece of equipment? Sure, this is our uh, interactive forensic imaging system. It's a piece of equipment which uses a camera head at the top here and software that's on the laptop here to produce a scan of the crime scene. So in this particular room, from where we're positioned, it will scan this room at 360 degrees. The technology we've uh, implemented was first implemented in 1998 uh, when our inspector uh, first developed or researched uh, the idea. Uh, in, that, uh, in those preliminary stages, we used a uh, digital still camera uh, where we took a series of photographs and then we had to come back to uh, use computer software to stitch all of those photographs together. Uh, the new system that we use now uh, basically scans the area in uh, one single movement and allows us to more quickly put together the nodes that we require to put together an uh, actual scene that we use for court purposes. The basic working of it is uh, fairly straightforward. It's all operated off the uh, laptop as you can see here. Uh, once it's all set up and ready to go, we calibrate the scan head to the, uh, to the room, to the light that's coming into the room. Uh, and then it's a simple matter of just uh, plugging in a scan and having it scan the room. The Queensland Police Forensic Services have been rewarded significantly for the contribution they play in solving crime. Last year we received a Premier's Award for the Remote Data Entry Project and this year we've received an Institute of Public Administration Queensland Award for the DNA Improvement Strategy. Uh, incidentally, this award has been nominated as a finalist for the Institute of Public uh, Administration Prime Minister's Award, which will be later announced this year. Um, Queensland Police has taken slightly a different focus to other law enforcement agencies, both nationally and internationally. Certainly the techniques that we use at a crime scene, the advances in, say, DNA and fingerprinting uh, in science or physical evidence examination mirror that of what is being done internationally because we share those ideas uh, across the globe. Where we've taken a different approach is we've tried to apply technologies that will allow, allow us to use the same techniques, same methods, same recording methods at all levels of crime, whether that be volume crime, uh, a simple break and enter to a vehicle, uh, right through to serious matters like murder investigations. We're using the same technologies uh, and therefore getting the same quick turnaround and results. So we've seen the process of collecting the evidence at the scene of this crime. That concludes part one of the Real CSI, Queensland Police Forensics. Join me next week for part two of the Real CSI, Queensland Police Forensics, where hopefully we can close the case on this crime. Don't forget you can find out more about any of the episodes online at 31.com.au slash nswk. Good night.